One of Us is Lying by Kara McManus, Chapter 22 Cooper, Sunday, October 21st, 5.25 p.m. We've almost finished dinner when Pop's phone rings. He looks at the number and picks up immediately, the lines around his mouth deepening. This is Kevin. Yeah. What, tonight? Is that really necessary? He waits a beat. All right, we'll see you there. He hangs up and blows out an irritated sigh. We gotta meet your lawyer at the police station in half an hour. Detective Chang wants to talk to you again. He holds up a hand when I open my mouth. I don't know what about. I swallow hard. I haven't been questioned in a while, and I'd been hoping the whole thing was fading away. I want to text Daddy and see if she's getting brought in too, but I'm under strict orders not to put anything about the investigation in writing. Calling Addie is not a great idea either, so I finish my dinner in silence and drive to the station with Pop. My lawyer, Mary, is already talking with Detective Chang when we get inside. He beckons us toward the interrogation room, which is nothing like you see on TV. No big pane of glass with a two-way mirror behind it. Just a drab little room with a conference table and a bunch of folding chairs. Hello, Cooper. Mr. Clay, thanks for coming. I'm about to brush, brush past him through the door when he puts a hand on my arm. You sure you want your father here? I'm about to ask why wouldn't I? But before I can speak, Pop starts blustering about how it's his God-given right to be present during questioning. He has this speech perfected, and once he winds up, he needs to finish. Of course, Detective Chang says politely, it's mainly a privacy issue for Cooper. The way he says that makes me nervous, and I look to Mary for help. It should be fine to start with just me in the room, Kevin, she says. I'll bring you in if needed. Mary's okay. She's in her fifties, no nonsense, and can handle both the police and my father. So in the end, it's me, Detective Chang, and Mary seating ourselves around the table. My heart's already pounding when Detective Chang pulls out a laptop. You've always been vocal about Simon's accusation not being true, Cooper, and there's been no drop in your baseball performance, which is inconsistent with the reputation of Simon's app. It wasn't known for posting lies. I try to keep my expression neutral. Even though I've been thinking the same thing, I was more relieved than mad when Detective Chang first showed me in Simon's sight, because a lie was better than the truth. But why would Simon lie about me? So we dug a little deeper. Turns out we missed something in our initial analysis of Simon's files. There was a second entry for you that was encrypted and replaced with the steroids accusation. It took a while to get that file figured out, but the original is here. He turns the screen so it's facing Mary and me. We lean forward together to read it. Everybody wants a piece of Bayview Southpaw CC, and he's finally been tempted. He's stepping out on the beauteous KS with the hot German underwear model. What guy wouldn't, right? Except the new love interest models boxers and briefs, not bras and thongs. Sorry, Kay, but you can't compete when you play for the wrong team. Every part of me feels frozen except my eyes, which can't stop blinking. This is what I was afraid I'd see weeks ago. Cooper, Mary's voice is even. There's no need to react to this. Do you have a question, Detective Chang? Yes, is the rumor Simon plans to print true, Cooper? Mary speaks before I can. There's nothing cr criminal in this accusation. Cooper doesn't need to address it. Mary, you know that's not the case. We have an interesting situation here. Four students with four entries they want to keep quiet. One gets deleted and replaced with a fake. Do you know what that looks like? Shoddy rumor mongery? Mary asks. Like someone ac accessed Simon's files to get rid of this particular entry and made sure Simon wouldn't be around 
the correct way. I feel I need a few minutes with my client, Mary says. I feel sick. I've imagined breaking the news about Chris to my parents in dozens of ways, but none as flat-out horrible as this. Of course, you should know we'll be requesting a warrant to search more of Clay's home beyond Cooper's computer and cell phone records. Given this new information, he's a more significant person of interest than he was previously. Mary has a hand on my arm. She doesn't want me to talk. She doesn't have to worry. I couldn't if I tried. Disclosing information about sexual orientation violates constitutional rights to privacy. That's what Mary says, and she's threatened to involve the American Civil Liberties Union if the police make Simon's post about me public, which would fall into the category of too little, way too late. Detective Chang dances around it. They have no intention of invading my privacy, but they have to investigate. It would help if I told them everything. Our definitions of everything are different. His includes me confessing that I killed Simon, deleted my about that entry, and replaced it with a fake about one about steroids, which makes no sense. Wouldn't I have taken myself out of the equation entirely? Or come up with something less career-threatening, like cheating on Keeley with another girl? That might have killed two birds with one stone, so to speak. This changes nothing, Mary keeps saying. You have no more proof than you ever did that Cooper touched Simon's sight. Don't you dare disclose sensitive information in the name of your investigation. The thing is, though, it doesn't matter. It's getting out. This case has been full of leaks from the beginning, and I can't waltz out of here after being interrogated for an hour and tell my father nothing's changed. When Detective Chang leaves, he makes it clear they'll be digging deep into my life over the next few days. They want Chris's number. Mary tells me I don't have to provide it, but Detective Chang reminds her they'll subpoena my cell phone and get it anyway. They want to talk to Keeley, too. Mary keeps threatening the ACLU, and Detective Chang keeps telling her, mild as skim milk, that they need to understand my actions in the weeks leading up to the murder. But we all know what's really happening. They'll make my life miserable until I cave from the pressure. I sit with Mary in the interrogation room after Detective Chang leaves, thankful there's no two-way mirror as I bury my head in my hands. Life as I knew it is over, and pretty soon nobody will look at me the same way. I was going to tell eventually, but in a few years, maybe, when I was a star pitcher and untouchable. Not now, not like this. Cooper. Mary puts a hand on my shoulder. Your father will be wondering why we're, we're still in here. You need to talk to him. I can't, I automatically, I say automatically. Can't. Your father loves you, she says quietly. I almost laugh. Pop loves Cooperstown. He loves when I strike out the side and get attention from flashy scouts and when my name scrolls across the bottom of ESPN. But me? He doesn't even know me. There's a knock on the door before I can reply. Cop pokes his head in and snaps his fingers. We done in here? I want to get home. All set, I say. The hell was that all about? He demands of Mary. You and Cooper need to talk, she says. Cop's draw, jaw tenses. What the hell are we paying you for? Is written all over his face. We can discuss next steps after that. Fantastic, Pop mutters. I stand and squeeze myself through the narrow gap between the table and the wall, ducking past Mary and into the hallway. We walk in silence, one in front of the other, until we pass through the double glass doors and Mary murmurs a goodbye. 
night, Pop says, tersely leading the way to our car at the far end of the parking lot. Everything in me clenches and twists as I buckle myself next to him in the Jeep. How do I start? What do I say? Do I tell him now or wait till we're home and I can tell Mom and Noni and, oh God, Lucas? What was all that about, Pop asks. What took you so long? There's new evidence, I say woodenly. Yeah, what's that? I can't, I can't. Not just the two of us in this car. Let's wait till we're home. This serious go? Pop glances at me as he passes a slow-moving Volkswagen. You in trouble? My palms start sweating. Let's wait, I repeat. I need to tell Chris what's happening, but I don't dare text him. I should go to his apartment and explain in person. Another conversation that'll kill some part of me. Chris has been out since junior high. His parents are both artists, and it was never a big deal. They were pretty much like, yeah, we knew. What took you so long? He's never pressured me, but sneaking around isn't how he wants to live. I stare out the window, my fingers tapping on the door handle for the rest of the ride home. Pop pulls into the driveway, and our house looms in front of me, solid, familiar, and the last place I want to be right now. We head inside. Pop tossing his keys onto the hallway table and catching sight of my mother in the living room. She and Noni are sitting next to each other on the couch as though they've been waiting for us. Where's Lucas? I ask, following Pop into the room. Downstairs playing Xbox. Mom mutes the television as Noni cocks her head to one side and fastens her eyes on me. Everything okay? Cooper's being all mysterious. Pop's glance at me is half shrewd, half dismissive. He doesn't know whether to take my obvious freaking out seriously or not. You tell us, Cooperstown, what's all the fuss about? They got some actual evidence this time? They think they do. I clear my throat and push my hands into my khakis. I mean, they do have new information. Everybody's quiet, absorbing that, until they notice I'm not in any hurry to continue. What kind of new information? Mom prompts. There was an entry on Simon's site that was encrypted before the police got there. I guess it's what he originally meant to post about me. Nothing to do with steroids. There goes my accent again. Pop never lost his and doesn't notice when mine fades in and out. I knew it, he says triumphantly. They clear you then? I'm mute, my mind blank. Noni leans forward, hands gripping her skull-topped cane. Cooper, what was Simon going to post about you? Well, a couple of words is all it'll take to make everything in my life before and after. The air leaves my lungs. I can't look at my mother, and I sure as hell can't look at my father, so I focus on Noni. Simon somehow found out that God, I've run out of filler words. Noni taps her cane on the floor like she wants to help me along. I'm gay. Pop laughs. Actually laughs a relieved kind of guffaw, and slaps me on the shoulder. Jesus, Coop had me going there for a minute. Seriously, what's up? Evan, Noni grits the word through her teeth. Cooper is not joking. Of course he is, Pop says, still laughing. I watch his face because I'm pretty sure it's the last time he'll look at me the way he always has. Right? His eyes slide over to mine, casual and confident. But when he sees my face, his smile dims. There it is. Right, Coop? Wrong, I tell him.
Chapter 23, Addie. Monday, October 22nd, 8.45 a.m. Police cars lined the front of Bayview High again, and Cooper's stumbling through the hall like he hasn't slept in days. It doesn't occur to me the two might be related until he pulls me aside before first fell. Can we talk? I peer at him more closely, unease gnawing at my stomach. I've never seen Cooper's eyes look bloodshot before. Yeah, sure. I think he means here in the hallway, but to my surprise, he leads me up the back staircase into the parking lot where we lean against the wall next to the door which means I'll be late for homeroom, I guess. But my attendance record is already so bad, another tardy won't make a difference. What's up? Cooper runs a hand through his sandy hair until it sticks straight up, which is not a thing I ever imagined Cooper's hair could do until just now. I think the police are here because the baby, because of, because of me, to ask questions about me. I just wanted to tell somebody why before everything goes to hell. Okay, I put a hand on his forearm and tense and surprise when, when I feel it shaking. Cooper, what's wrong? So the thing is, he pauses, swallowing hard. He looks like he's about to confess something. For a second, Simon flashes through my mind his collapse in detention, and his red, gasping face as he struggled to breathe. I can't help him. I can't help but flinch. Then I met, meet Cooper's eyes, filming with tears, but as kind as ever, and I know that can't be it. The thing is what, Cooper? The thing is what, Cooper? It's all right, you could tell me. Cooper stares at me, taking in the whole picture, messy hair that's spiking oddly because I didn't take the time to blow dry it, so-so skin from all the stress, faded t-shirt featuring some band Ashton used to like because we're seriously behind on laundry. Before he replies, I'm gay. Oh. It doesn't register at first, and then it does. Oh, the whole not into Keeley thing suddenly makes sense. It seems like I should say more than that, so I add, cool. Inadequate response, I guess, but sincere, because Cooper's pretty great, except the way he's always being a little remote. This explains a lot. Simon found out I'm seeing someone, a guy. He was going to post it on about that with everyone else's entries. They got switched out and replaced with a fake entry about me using steroids. I didn't switch it, he adds hastily, but they think I did. So they're looking into me hardcore now, which means the whole school will know pretty soon. I guess I wanted to tell somebody myself. Cooper, no one will care. I start, but he shakes his head. They will, you know they will, he says. I drop my eyes because I can't deny it. I've been hiding my head under a rock about this whole investigation, he continues. His voice hoarse, hoping they'd talk it up to an accident, because there's no real proof about anything. Now I keep thinking about what Maeve said about Simon the other day, how much weird stuff was going on around him. You think there's anything to that? Bronwyn does, I say. She wants the four of us to get together and compare notes. She says Nate will. Cooper nods distractedly, and it occurs to me that since he's still in Jake's bubble most of the time, he's not fully up to speed on everything that's been going on. Did you hear about Nate's mom, by the way? How she's, um, not dead after all? I didn't think Cooper could get any paler, but he manages. What? Kind of a long story, but yeah. Turns out she was a drug addict living in some kind of commune, but she's back now, and sober, supposedly. Oh, and Brahman got called into the police station because of a creepy post Simon wrote about her sister's sophomore year. 
Bromwin told him to drop dead in the comment section. So, you know, that looks kind of bad now. The hell? By the incredulous look on Cooper's face, I've managed to distract him from his problems. Then the late bell rings and his shoulders sag. We better go. But yeah, if you guys get together, I'm in. The Bayview police set themselves up in a conference room with a school liaison again and start interviewing students one by one. At first, things are kind of quiet. When we get through the day without any rumors, I'm hopeful that Cooper was wrong about his secret getting out. But by mid-morning on Tuesday, the whispers start. I don't know if it's the kind of question the police were asking, or who they were talking to, or just a good old-fashioned leap. But before lunch, my ex-friend Olivia, who hasn't spoken to me since Jake punched TJ, runs up to my locker and grabs my arm with a look of pure glee. Oh my God, did you hear about Cooper? Her eyes pop with excitement as she lowers her voice to a piercing whisper. Everyone's saying he's gay. I pull away. If Olivia thinks I'm grateful to be included in the gossip mill, she's wrong. Who cares? I say flatly. Well, Keely does. Olivia giggles, tossing her hair over, over her shoulder. No wonder he wouldn't sleep with her. Are you headed to lunch now? Yeah, with Bronwyn. See you. I slam my locker shut and spin on my heel before she can say anything else. In the cafeteria, I collect my food and head for our, and for our usual table. Bronwyn looks pretty in a sweater dress and boots. Her hair loose around her shoulders. Her cheeks are so pink. I wonder if she's wearing makeup for a change. But if she is, it's really natural. She keeps looking at the door. Expecting someone, I ask. She turns redder. Maybe. I have a pretty good idea who she's waiting for. Probably not Cooper, although the rest of the room seems to be. When he steps into the cafeteria, everything goes quiet and then a low whispering buzz runs through the room. Cooper Clay is Cooper Gay, somebody calls out in a high falsetto voice, and Cooper freezes in the door as something flies through the air and hits him across the chest. I recognize the blue packaging immediately. Soldier condoms, Jake's brand, along with half the school, I guess, but it did come from the direction of my old table. Doing the butt, hey, pretty, pretty, somebody else sings, and laughter runs through the room. Some of it's mean, but a lot of it's shocked and nervous. Most people look like they don't know what to do. I'm struck silent because Cooper's face the worst thing I've ever seen, and I want so badly for this not to be happening. Oh, for fuck's sake. It's Nate. He's in the entrance next to Cooper, which surprises me since I've never seen him in the cafeteria before. The rest of the room is equally taken aback, quieting enough that his contemptuous voice cuts across the whispers as he surveys the scene in front of him. You losers seriously give a crap about this? Get a life. A girl's voice calls out. Boyfriend. Disguised with a fake cough. Vanessa smirks as everyone around her dissolves into a kind of laughter that's been directed my way over the past month. Half guilty, half gleeful. And all, thank God, this is happening to you and not me. The only exceptions are Keely, who's biting her lip and staring at the door, and Louise, who's half standing with his forearms braced on the table. One of the lunch ladies hovers in the doorway between the kitchen and cafeteria, seemingly torn between letting things play out and getting a teacher to intervene. Nate zeroes in on Vanessa's smug face without a trace of self-consciousness. 
really? You've got something to say? I don't even know your name, and you tried to stick your hand down my pants the last time we were at a party. More laughter, but this time it's not at Cooper's expense. In fact, if there's a guy at Bayview you haven't tried that with, I'd love to meet him. Vanessa's mouth hangs open as a hand shoots up from the middle of the cafeteria. Me, calls a boy sitting at the computer, computer nerd table. His friends all laugh nervously as the pulsing attention of the room. Seriously, like it, it's like a wave moving from one target to the next focuses on them. Nate gives him a thumbs up and looks back at Vanessa. There you go. Try to make that happen and shut the hell up. He crosses to our table and dumps his backpack next to Bronwyn. She stands up, winds her arm around his neck and kisses him like they're alone while the entire cafeteria erupts into gasps and catcalls. I stare as much as everyone else. I mean, I kind of guessed, but this is pretty public. I'm not sure if Bronwyn's trying to distract everyone from Cooper or if she couldn't help herself. Maybe both. Either way, Cooper's effectively been forgotten. He's motionless at the entrance until I grab his arm. Come sit, the whole murder club at one table. They can stare at all of us together. Cooper follows me, not bothering to get any food. We settle ourselves at the table, and awkward silence descends until someone else approaches. Luis with his tray in hand, lowering himself into the last empty chair at our table. That was bullshit, he fumes, looking at the empty space in front of Cooper. Aren't you going to eat? I'm not hungry, Cooper says shortly. You should eat something. Luis grabs the only untouched food item on his tray and holds it out. Here, have a banana. Everyone freezes for a second, then we all burst out laughing at the same time, including Cooper, who rests his chin in his palm and massages his temple with his other hand. I'll pass, he says. I've never seen Louise so red. Why couldn't it have been Apple Day? He mutters, and Cooper gives him a tired smile. You find out who your real friends are when stuff like this happens. Turns out I didn't have any. But I'm glad Cooper does.